our purpose here in the policy panel is to discuss what all of uh, what we've been discussing for the past couple of days means for monetary policy, to translate it into policy, and um, I think broadly to muse a little bit on the world facing central bankers today, the environment of low growth, low inflation, high unemployment, uh, and what this means and what we might do. And I wanted to really try and cover, I hope, three, three broad topics. The first is to explore a little more the relationship between monetary policy and structural reform, something we've discussed a lot, but also fiscal policy. Secondly, to look a little bit at what the consequences of today's environment of accommodative monetary policy are, particularly two areas that are sometimes controversial. One, the impact on distribution, and secondly, the trade-off, if there is one, with price stability and financial stability. And thirdly, before we go to questions, to stand back a little and muse about where we are in the world of central banking in terms of whether there's been a paradigm shift or if there hasn't, whether there needs to be one. So to have that conversation, there is frankly uh, no better cast of three people. Thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, Harry Kokoroda, I was going to ask, start with you. Um, the question of what is the optimal coordination between monetary policy, fiscal policy, and structural reform is something that you have clearly been grappling with because mm. the three arrows of Arbonomics are precisely those three policy levers. Mm. Uh, you've had two years experience of it. Um, how important is structural policy? How important is fiscal policy? Mm. And how much is it really up to you as the central bank? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for raising a very important uh, question. Um, before going into economics uh, and structural reforms and so on and so forth, uh, let me speak a little bit about uh, inflation uh, and unemployment in Japan. Uh, for the Bank of Japan, uh, employment is not explicitly included in its monetary policy mandate, unlike in the Federal Reserve. Uh, However, unemployment is still a very useful guide for us in pursuing price, uh, price stability. Uh, and also, uh, it is widely <laughs> recognized that uh, price stability must be secured because it is uh, indispensable for the health of the economy, which of course has a direct impact on workers. So, uh, despite some seeming differences in the mandates, written in their respective statutes, there is little practical difference between major central banks across jurisdictions. Uh, nevertheless, there are remarkable differences between the US, the Euro area, and Japan in their historical observations of unemployment and inflation. If you look at the uh, chart, or well, uh, graph, sim simple graph, a scattered diagram showing unemployment and inflation for these three jurisdictions. The horizontal axis is unemployment rate, the vertical one is inflation rate. Uh, there are two approaches uh, regarding how to interpret this graph. One approach is to focus on where each cluster of dots is located. There is a well-known measure of welfare, the misery index, which is a simple sum of unemployment rate and inflation rate. If misery index is indeed the most accurate measure of welfare, the further northeast an economy is located, the more miserable the state of that economy. In this interpretation, Japan's performance has been consistently outstanding for many years with the lowest unemployment rate and lowest inflation among the three. However, the middle index is an indicator that makes sense only in a high inflation environment, which has not been the case in major economies for the last uh, uh, few decades. Therefore, middle index would not, in fact, give us any useful hints in evaluating the monetary policies of major central banks. The other approach is to interpret the clusters as each jurisdiction's Phillips curve, where the underlying theory is that inflation dynamics can be explained in the context of slacking in the labor market. As a matter of fact, uh, this simple graph appears to suggest that 
Phillips curves for the US and the Euro area have barely sloped, if at all, since the middle of the 1990s. One important aspect of the, is that both flat curves are located at around 2% inflation. In other words, the inflation rate has been mostly stable around 2%, irrespective of monotable ups and downs in unemployment. Inflation has been well anchored at the level intended by the respective central banks in the US and the Euro area. On the other hand, Japan's uh, Phillips curve is unique in two points. First, the negative correlation between unemployment and inflation is more apparent in Japan. Second, and more importantly, the curve crosses the zero inflation line with a larger part of it remaining in negative territory. This suggests that long-term long inflation expectations in Japan has been around zero or even slightly negative for nearly two decades since the mid-1990s. This is exactly the problem with the Bank of Japan decided to address decisively a little over two years ago through quantitative and qualitative monetary easing. Our intention was to hold, first, to stimulate the economy throughout various uh, uh, transmission channels and thereby move the economy and the inflation in the northwest direction along our moderately but still meaningfully slope Phillips curve. And second, to create higher inflation expectations. Can I, and thereby, can I just yeah. interrupt you there? I'm sorry, yeah. because we haven't got that much yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, oh, of course. Uh, Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, what uh, this uh, simple curve shows, uh, the situation uh, surrounding uh, unemployment, inflation, nexus is quite different. That means that economic structures or the macroeconomic uh, uh, history mm -hmm. is quite different. And so that in the Japanese case, the first and foremost, uh, 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 the Bank of Japan is trying is to move toward the left or northwest, and by so doing, also uh, inflation expectations be raised, and the Phillips curve itself should shift upward. That's that's I can see that's a, uh, the challenge that the Bank of Japan faces. Mm -hmm. Could you just put that into? the context of what do you think the role of structural reform has been? Because that's been very much the subject of this conference. Yeah. Is, has it been important in Japan's case, or is that really a European phenomenon? I think uh, for, for the Japanese economy, uh, structural reform or structural changes are quite important. Uh, because uh, we suffered from uh, <coughs> demographic uh, Onus or demographic problem in the last uh, <clears throat> couple of decades. Population has been declining, uh, and uh, that uh, made uh, medium term growth uh, potential uh, lower and lower, and that created a uh, lot of problems. But what I would like to emphasize is on the one hand, structural reforms uh, to raise uh, medium term growth potential is quite important and, 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 uh, and vital. But on the other hand, um, monetary policy must address deflation, mm -hmm. uh, which is basically monetary phenomena. And uh, the eradicating deflation is, uh, is absolutely necessary and also could uh, uh, make uh, structural reforms uh, uh, even less painful, because if you have uh, deflation and, and high uh, unemployment and so on and so forth, then uh, structural reforms, which could be uh, quite painful uh, in some sectors, uh, at least in the short run, uh, could be very difficult to be implemented. But if your economy uh, grows, uh, uh, with 2% uh, with, uh, or so inflation rate, then 
uh, even uh, serious and severe uh, structural reforms uh, may be uh, accepted by the general public. And in that sense, in, in that indirect sense, monetary policy may uh, also uh, contribute, but may help uh, uh, structural reform be uh, implemented uh, 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 vigorously. So it's an indirect relationship. Mm. Stan yeah. Fisher, um, uh, structural reform is not something that you hear very much from Fed governors. Uh, what is your sense of what the relationship is between uh, what should a central bank, what's appropriate for central bankers to, how should central bankers think about structural reforms and what should they say about them? Well, I think they should think about them in, in the context of what is the uh, expected growth rate uh, of the economy. And uh, the other side of it is that in the United States, I think the most important thing uh, relative to monetary policy done on by the government on the structural side is the Dodd-Frank Act, which is a very massive, huge uh, change in the uh, structure, likely to produce a big change in the structure of the uh, financial uh, sector and very important for financial s stability going ahead. And that was done very quickly. The other negative aspect on uh, structural reform is the, uh, the issue that has been emphasized a lot in this conference, which is uh, infrastructure investment. And that uh, we heard uh, yesterday an emphasis on this is a good time to do it, the interest rate is very low, et cetera. And there, but there is general agreement that United States infrastructure, public infrastructure, uh, could do with a lot of investment and you just need to go on trains in, the two kind of, in Europe or the United States to figure that out or airports, the whole transportation infrastructure is part of that. That's the part that hasn't been done and it looks like uh, it's not going to be done in the near future. So there we just, uh, we take that as given. There's nothing we can do about it. We would much prefer that there was an active infrastructure investment, public infrastructure program, uh, but it isn't uh, happening. And, um, you know, there's the general issue of what do we say about things that aren't under our control, but that matter from the viewpoint of the economy. And the answer is, you can talk about it from time to time, but you can't make this your main uh, talking point every time you meet the press. Uh, uh, I used to say when I was in the IMF, if you want a good critique of monetary policy, go to the, go to the finance ministry. If you want a good critique of, finance po of, uh, financial, uh, of, of budgetary policy, go to the central bank. We don't want to be like that. And uh, we try uh, not to be, but those, the temptation is there, but we resist it. So, Mario Draghi, you spoke very eloquently about the importance of structural reform yesterday. You said it was necessary for the economy's resilience and obviously also to boost growth. Um, I guess it was, what, almost a year ago at Jackson Hole, you spoke also about things other than monetary policy, but you emphasized fiscal policy. And so I'm wondering, in the realm of things that are not immediately under the control of a central banker, uh, how do you think about fiscal policy uh, versus or in addition to structural reform and which is more important? Well, let me first uh, uh, make a more general point. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't resist, I can't resist responding to those cries for democratic legitimacy <laughs> or actually lack of it when central bank governors speak about structural pol uh, reforms, <laughs> no, policies. It's less toxic. Um, now, let's, uh, I was trying to think when uh, uh, there were other cases when central bank governors have spoken in the past about things that were not exactly under their control. And one example that came to mind is when they were speaking against explosive wage indexation mechanisms in the 70s. Another case that came to mind is when they spoke against fiscal excesses in the 80s and the 90s. And another more recent case, is when famous words were said during the Euro crisis in August 2012. In all these cases, there were cries and huge, loud protestations 
that we were acting and speaking outside our mandate. On the contrary, in the early 2000, 2002, 2003, and 2004, we all wished central bank governors had spoken more against the destruction of the financial regulation which preceded the crisis in some major jurisdictions. And, uh, and unfortunately, they did not, because the general conviction at the time was that financial stability would not fall squarely in a central bank mandate. Now, of course, we changed minds since then. So you see that when you put these things in historical perspective, you start really thinking whether central bank governors shouldn't be, especially independent central bank governors, shouldn't be quite, uh, quite clear about speaking about things, policies, or lack of policies that hamper their mandate, that made their mandate more difficult or even impossible. And I think they should. Um, so that's a general point. Actually, I will get to the fiscal in a second, but I can't resist following up on that because you mentioned yesterday it's, it's not as though you're simply talk, advising on things that will generally improve the economy. You're, you made the argument that the structural reforms can have an impact on monetary policy, particularly when you're close to the zero lower bound. Yeah. So is it that you feel res the, need, the desire to discuss this because it is impacting monetary policy or because you feel the responsibility to tell policymakers about how to make the economy better? No, it's really, well, first of all, the first, the first reason is, the, is, is certainly true. And as I explained yesterday, it does impact on our monetary policy instruments. But it's also a second reason which makes the pursuit of uh, and the achievement of price stability much, much more difficult. Um, I think uh, Larry put it wonderfully yesterday. When, I mean, given that our monetary policy stance is uh, perfectly appropriate, and if need be, we do more than that. But uh, um, in a situation where you either have secular stagnation or you have a very uh, dominant structural component, uh, the monetary policy, as he said, doesn't have many attractive options if it pursues full employment or price stability risks to create financial instability or financial stability risks. If it pursues financial stability, it would uh, come at detriment of price stability or other objectives. So there must be other policies really that respond to these situations. Now, in, in our situation, it's a combination of cyclical and structural. So I'm now addressing my remarks to the structural component. And there, it's, there are two. Uh, two uh, policies, two set of policies that come to mind. One is uh, the demand policy, namely fiscal policy, and another one is structural policies. Now, in Jackson Hole, I argued for fiscal policy, looking, addressing the issue of uh, an aggregate fiscal stance for the euro area. And I think a case can be done, can be made for that, but it should be very, very carefully specified. Because if we go back to pre-crisis times, you see that in most countries in the euro area, you see what sort of fiscal policies they, were, they, they had run. Uh, current government expenditures increased significantly, and they were financed by raising taxes, by debt issuance, and by cutting public investment. So that's exactly what you don't want to see today. So you don't want to raise taxes, cut public investments, or raise current expenditure. So you can make a case for a targeted, well-designed, well what we call growth-friendly fiscal expansion. But certainly today and yesterday, we're devoted to see what sort of lack of structural policies we have to address, and we listed many of them. By the way, uh, the, the, I was quite explicit that I don't want to start with dismantling labor protection. There are many other uh, structural policies here. Clearly, there is a strong case for sequencing them in the right, and many, many deep, thoughtful remarks have been made as far as the sequencing of structural reforms is concerned, the timing, and the credibility. Because, for example, if you reform the pension system, and you change mind every year. You don't get any short-term benefit because the expectation of a higher permanent income is 
isn't there. And uh, so, credibility, timing, sequencing. Harry Kokoro, do you agree with uh, Maria Draghi? Do you think that uh, it is both appropriate, indeed necessary, for you to get involved in discussions about fiscal policy and structural policy? And have you done so in Japan? Tell us about how that works in Japan. Uh, yes, uh, two things. One, in Japan, as you may know, uh, two and a half years ago, the government and the Bank of Japan agreed uh, to a set of uh, economic policies. Uh, and uh, they uh, issued a so-called joint statement in which the Bank of Japan committed itself to achieve uh, the 2% inflation target uh, at the earliest possible time. Uh, on the other hand, the government uh, uh, committed two things. Uh, one, uh, in the short run, the government would provide fiscal stimulus, but in the medium to long run, it would uh, consolidate the fiscal uh, position uh, in a timely manner. And uh, second, of course, uh, various uh, structural reforms, uh, deregulation, so on and so forth, uh, to raise medium term uh, potential growth. So this is not, uh, 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 if you do, uh, then I will do, or if you don't, we don't. <laughs> that, that kind of thing, it is not. It is simply a statement of division of labor. But did they, so did the they Bank of Japan enough? would achieve uh, the 2% uh, price stability target irrespective of government policies. And the government, uh, hopefully, irrespective of Bank of Japan's uh, uh, monetary policy, they would do fiscal consolidation and, and, and uh, structural reforms. So, but this uh, joint statement uh, provided me to uh, fairly freely speak about structural reforms, fiscal consolidation, and uh, for instance, uh, in the area of structural reform, I strongly argue that, uh, that uh, uh, women and, uh, and foreigners uh, should uh, 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 contribute more to the Japanese economic uh, uh, growth and so on and so forth, and also corporate governance uh, must be uh, <coughs> substantially improved and so on and so forth. So I think uh, this uh, joint statement provided a framework for uh, not just mutual understanding, but uh, mutual uh, criticism or uh, well, in argumentation. In the spirit of constructive mutual yeah. criticism, yeah. have they done enough? Um, I think something have been done. <laughs> But more must be done. More must be done. Thank you. Um, let's turn to the second or topic. Any, could I, could oh, you I, wanted yeah. to? On a, sure, on a, do. A point. I, there are sort of interesting questions on uh, structural work. We have, all of us, large research departments. We have very good researchers. They start working on a topic uh, relating to growth. It'll have a lot to say about government policies and other areas. Well, we try to preserve that freedom of expression by saying these are the views of the staff and so forth. They always get published. A Federal Reserve paper says, and no, uh, no subtlety about it. But I think you have to let that, uh, let that happen. Secondly, on talking about um, macro, I think it's perfectly OK to talk about macro about the size of the budget deficit, about its consequences, the things that uh, Mario mentioned. I would avoid talking about the allocation of government spending that reflects the tastes of the government or the preferences of the government to the extent you can. We're interested in growth. That's a legitimate aim of ours. We can, I think, mention, say, infrastructure investment, education, et cetera, as deserving of government uh, support. Uh, I would never venture to discuss whether the defense budget is adequate <laughs> for, the, uh, for the needs of the nation, although that certainly will have a big influence on fiscal policy. That's not really anything but we have anything useful to, I have anything useful to say about. But within the area of structural reform, um, right. 
Is it appropriate for you to venture what kinds of structural reforms make sense or, or are better and are not so good? Because there was a very, as you know, a very lively discussion this morning about whether, how, I mean, you, you've stayed very clearly timing and composition and so forth, but how detailed should central bankers get, Stan? I don't think we should be uh, detailed about things if we don't have evidence or empirical research on it. But you have a huge research staff of you. Yes, but me. you also would like them to have done work in the relevant area before you go out and uh, express. Once they've done work, should central bankers? <laughs> <laughs> Mario. Uh, yeah, we well, I, I gave you a question. <laughs> no, I think I think the um, this exchange shows what's the difference between U.S. and Europe. Yes. In, uh, in, in Europe, the structural component of the low growth is much bigger, as all the data and the discussions have shown yesterday. So that's why the need to, uh, by the way, the central banks, I mean, ECB doesn't want to be intrusive, doesn't want to tell people exactly, governments, uh, what exactly what to do, how to sequence, who does what, and so on. So it's very much a policy appeal to action. For example, yesterday there was, discussion on whether it makes sense to postpone a reform that you know it's good to times when the world will be a better place to live in. Now, it's clear that from the other parts of the discussion, there is, there's, there's not going to be any better moment for doing the right reform than now. It was quite clear. So, but, uh, of course, as I said, I mean, we've we got to be... Uh, this is the major problem in Europe. It hampers the mandate of the central bank. It makes it more difficult. It does affect the monetary policy in various ways that we've discussed yesterday. So we want to make this quite clear. At the same time, we don't want to be intrusive because we are aware that we enter into a, a but there, I mean, I made all the examples before, yeah. wage indexation, excess fiscal deficits, and so on. So I, but, but, there's no but need within, to repeat But within, that. sorry to, to press this, but yeah. within structural reforms, I mean, it's, you, you say you make the appeal for doing it. There's no better time yeah. than now. But there are, as you said yesterday, and as many people said this morning, there are different short-term and long-term effects from different kinds of structural. Should you be product market? Should it be labor market? If so, which sort? If you don't get into that detail, you're just saying, you know, motherhood and apple pie, right? Structural reform is great. No, no because there is a lot of work uh, done by people also who are in this room that uh, have uh, shown what the right sequence is, and certainly product reforms, services reforms. The, in Europe, the application of the single, the full application of the single market legislation uh, should be the first priority. Okay. Let's, go, let's turn to another um, controversial subject, which is the consequence of accommodative monetary policy, particularly unconventional measures, uh, in two areas. Firstly, distributional, and secondly, on financial stability. Stan, all, all monetary policy has distributional consequences. Um, is there something special about unconventional monetary policy and something more disturbing in its distributional consequences? Well, it, what you say about all monetary policy uh, having distributional consequences is correct. When we raise the interest rate, we certainly affect the housing sector more than most other sectors or investment more than, than most others, and that's generally true. But it's been around for so long that everybody thinks it's perfectly normal and perfectly neutral, and that's sort of accepted. Now, uh, quant quantitative easing is uh, unusual. It looks like magic to many people. It looks like uh, bad magic to a lot of people. And the question is, uh, how do you explain it? And what are the adverse consequences? There's no question that the zero interest rates affect savers uh, more than it affects uh, people who are not yet at that stage of their lives. And we have to uh, recognize that. And we have to make the case that what is being done for the economy as a whole is outweighs that particular uh, effect. And the broader case is getting the economy back to growth, and we don't have a lot of methods other than fiscal expansion and, uh, and monetary expansion uh, to do it. Getting the economy back to growth is what will really make a difference to the future of savers and so forth. So we have, but you have to keep making the case. I mean, we had a discussion yesterday about how um, 
we central bankers should be more willing to accept criticism and uh, that we can't expect to make criticisms and, um, and not be subject to them. Well, I haven't noticed that we're, uh, we in the Fed at least are not subject to criticism. <laughs> in fact, I read it every morning. Uh, I get a particular newspaper which seems to be devoted to this, uh, to this, <laughs> no. this topic, but I can't continue, I'm sure. <laughs> Mario, um, you, you've spoken about this um, before, the relationship of the distributional consequences and how one should think about them. Is there a macroeconomic rationale for being concerned about income inequality? Well, there certainly is. First, second, I agree with Stan about the consequence of low interest rates on savers. They are very, very significant in, uh, in, in the euro area. Also, what he said about the best case for that is to go back to decent growth, good growth. But also, let me add in this, uh, this vein that the major source of inequality is unemployment. So what we do about decreasing unemployment is the best response to inequality. So if the monetary policy, if, if QE will actually achieve its objectives of, we say, pri reaching price stability, or in another language, lowering unemployment rate, uh, that's the best response to, to the criticisms that say that, uh, that uh, QE causes uh, or at least to say, to, to the consequence of monetary policy on inequality. And is it a difference in kind or just in degree with the distributional consequences of just lowering and raising short-term interest rates? Sorry, what do you mean? Is, is, the, is the distributional impact of unconventional policies simply the same kind of mechanism as you have if you lower or raise the short-term interest rate, or is it is the mechanism and the scale sufficiently different that you oh, need no. to think about it differently? Yeah, they're different. They're different in kind, different in quantity, different. Uh, they, are, uh, they, are, they are movements, shifts in uh, asset prices that are different from, uh, simple, from the movements we used to have with simple movements of interest rates, no doubt, and also in size. And obviously, you have a, you have a series of consequences on wealth distribution as well when you move asset prices. So, but the... I think the best, and that's why, in a sense, one of, the, one of the reasons why I was insisting so much on structural policies yesterday, uh, that is exactly what we want to leave, is the situation where we, are, uh, we have to implement policies that we know are going to be the right response, but we also are aware of, this, of, the, of the consequence they have on other, on other fronts, like one is distribution. There are others, of course. The, the other consequence that people worry about is the impact um, on financial stability. Haruhiko, um, is there a trade-off there between what you need to do to, to end deflation and get price stability and the impact it has on asset prices? Are you creating mm -hmm. the risks of too much financial instability? Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, there is uh, such a possibility uh, uh, in theory. <laughs> Uh, but as far as uh, current uh, Japanese situation is concerned, we don't see such uh, sort of uh, trade-off or, or, uh, or difficult uh, situation. Uh, because uh, every time when uh, monetary policy board meet, uh, it discuss not just uh, economic and... and, and uh, <coughs> inflation uh, situation, but also uh, financial market, uh, financial institutions, uh, uh, soundness of uh, the financial sector as a whole, and so on and so forth. And uh, so far, uh, we have not found any sort of uh, financial excess. Um, it may be... Uh, 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 a bit unique because uh, really nowadays we frequently talk uh, about the uh, gap between uh, risk taking or lack of risk taking in the real economy and uh, increasing risk taking in the financial sector, uh, the gap and so on. So. But in the case of uh, 
Japan, um, the financial sector is also not taking much risk. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, at this stage, uh, such a uh, <clears throat> trade-off or inconsistency is, not. Uh, is only a theoretical possibility. Uh, Stan, is it only a theoretical possibility in the US? Um, <laughs> Uh, or is it a uh, becoming an increasingly real risk? I think so far it's uh, mainly theoretical. The places where it's really shown up has been in countries where the financial system was not much uh, affected by the uh, crisis. You didn't see a lot of financial sector restructuring needed after, the, uh, after Lehman Brothers. And uh, interest rates had to be reduced for in international uh, reasons. And then there, were very there was very cheap financing of housing. And almost every country whose financial system stayed intact has had a problem with high housing prices, high and rising housing prices. And that's been a problem which has been dealt with to the uh, maximum extent possible in almost every country by using macroprudential policy, in particular uh, the uh, terms of uh, trying to change the legally permitted terms of mortgage uh, agreements. And so far, that's stayed uh, more or less under control. But it's something which has been a difficult result of this crisis. I don't see this happening in the United States at present. And uh, I, Janet gave a speech yesterday which said, uh, we're likely to lay, raise interest rates before the end of this year. I think if we stay on schedule, We'll probably take but care actually, of it. that's interesting the way you put it, because that, that begs an interesting question of whether, and I assume you were referring implicitly to your prior experience in talking about the, uh, the challenges facing countries whose financial systems had not been affected. Uh, now you're in a different part of the world with a different responsibility, but should, should the US take into account the uh, situation of the rest of the world, do we need more global coordination to prevent the risk of financial excesses elsewhere? Because the, the Fed does effectively set monetary policy for large chunks of the world. Well, I, we could do a lot of theoretical work on uh, invent a global utility function and let one person be with uh, the same in every country and so forth and try and work out what's optimal. There is another approach, our mandate is purely domestic. And uh, we would have a very hard time if we started getting into the business of global coordination. I think in any case, the primary service we can do to the world economy is keep the United States economy in as good shape as we can and return it to growth as quickly as, as we can. Uh, we'll leave it for future generations to figure out the legal basis and uh, the actual policies that would be needed for coordination. I think we're kind of uh, conflicted internally on this. We, we like to talk about risk sharing, which I think suggests that some of the time there should be differences between the uh, cyclical stages of different countries in the global economy. But actually, when you listen to what people want, they want interest rates to be moving up and down together. And I think they want, co they want the glo whole globe to go into uh, crises together or something like that. I think that uh, letting each country do its thing may produce a better long-term outcome. Mario, what's your take on that? I mean, here we have on the panel the world's three big central banks uh, represented. Would the world be a better place if you uh, coordinated more explicitly? I couldn't agree more with, uh, with, with Stan. It's just uh, our mandate speaks of price stability in the euro area. So yeah. it, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's domestic. And uh, what we can do, however, and we do this, is, uh, have, have in, is to have regular exchanges of information, uh, communication. Uh, but more than that seems to be difficult, both legally and, frankly, also sort of in, 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 in economically, it's hard to design any such a process. Um, so, a process for doing the coordination or a process for justifying the coordination? No, 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 a process of coordination, what it means. We're just going beyond regular exchanges of information. And um, so, 
entirely agree with Stan on that. Mario, you, you run the biggest coordinated monetary policy <laughs> in the world. <laughs> so he's that's learned true. how hard it is to coordinate. Yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, that's a very good segue to go to the last topic I wanted to cover before we open to questions, which is to try and stand back and... I know it's very difficult for the three of you to, to abstract from the legal and, and all the other constraints of your mandate right now, but part of the purpose of these kinds of discussions is to think about central banking and optimal central banking in a broader context. And you know, six, seven years after the crisis, do you think um, central banking has changed dramatically, should change dramatically? Do you need to have a deeper think about whether you have the right mandates, whether you need to, whether we need a more kind of existential rethink of what central banking is about, or basically are things fine? Um, Hariko, let's start with you. As far as the Bank of Japan is concerned, uh, <clears throat> I don't say we have been in a continuous sort of crisis, but uh, as far as uh, inflation rate is concerned, from 1998 through 2013, until two years ago, we, have, we had 15-year-long uh, deflation. That uh, <coughs> posed a serious uh, problem for the Bank of Japan. We tried many things, uh, but uh, couldn't uh, eradicate the uh, deflation. So two years ago, we substantially uh, changed our monetary policy, and we have been implementing so-called uh, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing. And uh, the economy certainly has uh, significantly improved, but still, we have very low inflation. So. Uh, <coughs> I think until we completely eradicate the deflationary mindset and uh, achieve 2% uh, uh, inflation in a stable manner, we will continue to be in a, if not crisis, but uh, extremely difficult situation. Would we be in a better world if we had a higher inflation target? Um, I, I, I mean, <laughs> Mr. Branshaw <laughs> is here, and a few years ago he advocated uh, um, higher inflation target, higher than two percent. Uh, for us, I think two percent is is the most appropriate, and uh, we are aiming at achieving uh, the two percent inflation target at the earliest uh, possible time. And uh, at this stage, uh, we don't uh, uh, think it necessary to consider other kind of target, uh, 3% or 4%, or uh, price level target, or nominal GDP target, or whatever target. Uh, at this stage, we uh, stick to the most uh, conventional <laughs> Uh, global standard kind of 2% uh, inflation target. Stan, what's your take on this? Do you think um, when the history books are written, people will say those central bankers in 2015, they were still stuck in an old mindset that was completely wrong? Or will they say they're in the, beginning, they're in the middle of a very big rethink of what central banking is about? Well, we are in the middle of one because we haven't uh, resolved the issue of how to deal with financial stability in the... Uh, central banks, and that discussion is, is going on. Um, you can say there's a very s small difference between saying, uh, having a lexicographic ordering and saying financial stability is one of your considerations, uh, is one of the things you should be thinking about. The uh, problem with it is having a responsibility without the tools to handle it, which is, say, the problem that the Fed would have in the United States. We have some tools, a lot of the tools on the hands of others. So there's things that need to be worked out in how this is supposed to work. We have the 
the FSOC, uh, the Financial Stability Oversight uh, Committee, but uh, it, uh, the British have a system which is, uh, which is, I think, well designed. Now, you have to wait and watch how these things work, because uh, you probably remember there was, everybody was entranced by the British uh, financial whatever it was, Stability Authority? Was FSA. That? <laughs> huh? yeah. FSC. A. 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 The FSA. But then came the crisis, and it turned out <laughs> that the entrancement was uh, just a temporary love affair, and uh, they had to reformulate uh, the system. And we, we are still in the stage of designing things. So I don't think we know, but we have to, uh, we have to deal with this. The other issue is, is a dual mandate, and that, I think, is less significant than, the way, than its weight in the discussion. And I think it's less significant because I know of no central bank that has ever not paid attention to the level of output in, this, in the business cycle, whether or not it's an inflation uh, targeter. And I think if they didn't take that into account, they'd be in trouble pretty soon anyway. So uh, there's not a big difference. It's sort of ironic at the present that we have an output target and we have an inflation target, and those are supposed to be conflicting. But we're more or less there on the output target, but we're not there on the inflation target, so that we have to put in a lot more steam, not because we've got output in the uh, loss function, but for the more traditional reason that we would have if we were a pure inflation target, and that's sort of the opposite of the situation you might have expected to arise with a dual, uh, with a dual target. There's one other um, big picture question, which is certainly um, current in the US, um, which is the question of your role as a lender of last resort. And that's, that's an area where certainly some quarters are questioning what you can and should be doing. And do you think that uh, that's a debate that should be had, or is it a misguided attempt to make it harder for central banks to do something that's existential to what they're supposed to do? Well, again, it's not something that we control the terms of the debate or whether there is a debate. There's a debate going on now. There is uh, an attempt to further restrict the capacity of the Fed to operate as lender of last resort. Um, this is a very complicated uh, issue, and it's complicated because as I said with financial stability, we won't know until the crisis comes. But I think that if the need ever arises for a, uh, a lender of last resort action of the traditional sort that has been around in practice for 200 years, written by a former editor of The Economist, uh, <laughs> the lender of well, last illustrious resort. Illustrious one. Uh, sorry. <laughs> another illustrious editor of The, uh, <laughs> of the Economist, uh, and used frequently to good effect, and not used once to bad effect in the Great Depression, uh, that we uh, have to think very, very hard about this, uh, this issue. I think it, it creates concerns that are justified about what will happen in a crisis. Mario, how do you think about the role, I mean, as the, I guess, the youngest central bank here, um, does, uh, has the crisis caused you to reflect on whether you have the right mandate, whether history books will say something different should be there, whether we're in a new era, and whether you need to change? Well, on the mandate, uh, that's one thing, for example, where the central banks shouldn't actually comment on because that's out its responsibility, entire responsibility of the legislators. So we are not free to pick, we are not free to pick what's the best mandate. But on what, um, basically, whether it makes a big difference or not, I would completely agree with Stan. Um, when we have a demand shock uh, reacting to price stability, we expand our monetary policy. When we have a supply shock, we look through the changes in prices. We don't react immediately. So you see that in the end, as he said, it doesn't make much difference, but in practice. But in, other than that, I wouldn't certainly want to comment on uh, what's the best mandate for, for the ECB. Uh, it seems that uh, the, the present mandate is such that we have, uh, by and large, achieved our, our objectives. Now, to your second question, 
uh, that's, more, that's more complicated in a sense because well, the, the crisis has produced many effects, one of which is to change forever the ECB. It was quite clear with the crisis, uh, the divergences amongst countries have increased significantly. So the ECB has reacted to this, uh, deciding that the mandate is always the same, namely price stability in the euro area, but the instruments have to change. Have, and in fact, after a few years now, we have a list, a catalog of instruments which is much, much bigger. And that's not going to change any, any, anymore. I mean, just that, that's gonna stay. So the ECB has, uh, it, perhaps exactly because of what you said, being the youngest of the central banks, has changed forever. Are these unconventional tools that are now part of your toolkit, uh, let's put it, part of the new normal, are they there for good? Well, they are there when needed, and they'll be used, they're gonna be used when, when it's needed. Uh, certainly, if you ask me what is my ambition in two, three years time, well, four, five, six years time, uh, seven, nine <laughs> years time <laughs> is, uh, is certainly not to be a zero lower bound. I think that is, uh, that is certainly something but that uh, a, a, any, any central bank wants to move from. And aren't there, well, if we're talking 10 years time, aren't those no, well, your first and second points linked? <laughs> it, no, but if you, if you want, and you, you mentioned this yesterday, if you are, if given your mandate and given where real rates are, you are much more likely to be at the zero, close to the zero lower bound than you would be if, you had a higher, if, if inflation had started higher. So the two parts of my question are actually linked. You, I understand you have your mandate and you mustn't comment on it, but in over a 10 year horizon, will central bankers be talking about, seriously about whether it makes more sense to have a higher inflation target to limit the risk of being close to the zero lower bound? I, I wouldn't actually discuss what's the right inflation target. We have, we have had uh, uh, lots of research, lots of work coming to this number, 2%, being done by lots of central banks, economists, and, um, and all in all, this, uh, this figure proved to be quite, uh, quite useful. Now, by the way, there are lots of people who are saying that in fact it should be zero. So uh, you see, as soon as you start, done? as soon as you start this discussion, you you have both sides, and um, so also, I mean, we've got to be modest now. Let's go back to two percent, but just below two percent, and then we'll talk. <laughs>